Hi there, and welcome to an interview with Christina and Sarah. They have just published a gorgeous book, and it's called The Knitting Pattern Writing Handbook. And um, I'm mostly here today to rave about it because I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, and I want these women to share with you a little bit about themselves and how they got to this point and why this book is so important. So if we haven't met before, my name's Becky. I'm the owner of Nomadic Knits and we like to talk about books. So welcome, Christina and Sarah. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having us, Becky. Oh, you're welcome. And where are you guys coming from? Where are you located right now? Roughly. I'm in Massachusetts, so I'm in the Northeast US. All right. And Me I too. live just south of the Oklahoma border in Texas, North Texas. So I'm Okay. Very nice. So you're probably a little cozier than we are today. <laughs> yeah, it's in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> it is, um, you know, been dipping for us. I'm in upstate New York. So oh, okay. yeah, it's, uh, it's been taking a little bit of a dive here, but that's okay. Winter is coming. Winter, winter right. is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Knit faster. <laughs> yeah. All right. I am going to start with you, Christina. And I was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you learn to knit? I learned to knit in a, just a knit life class at a high school when my um, firstborn was uh, almost two. I'd never been interested in crafts. I never really liked them. So I didn't get the benefit <laughs> of the wisdom and talent and experience of the wonderful people in my family who have these talents. Cause I was like, ah, no, no, thanks. And then um, I, I read about it in a yoga magazine and I was like, hmm, what's this all about? Cause I was kind of um, needing something for me that, God, I fell in love like that night. The first mm -hmm. night of the class, I drove to AC Moore or whatever and bought more, more stuff. <laughs> so I, cause it wasn't enough to have the one project that we had started. You know, I, I wanted to cast on again that she taught us and like, you know, so, um, oh. that's what, that's what that, that's, and then I just forget it. I got obsessed and that was the end of that. <laughs> I love the way you described it because that excitement that, you know, when you first realize like, oh, this is something I can do and now I can get all these supplies. Oh that feeling such a rush <laughs> and how about you Sarah I learned how to knit when I was a kid from my mom but it didn't take I didn't like it I preferred to crochet so I was a crocheter all the way through maybe my 30s and uh, I ended up being a homeschool mom where I was homeschooling my three children and while they were doing their lessons, I needed something to do with my hands, but crocheting for some reason was irritating my, my, it, like all the twisting was hurting my arms. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'll knit. And so it was right about the early 2000s where stuff was starting to come online where you could like go to a video online and watch it. And I retaught myself how to knit. And I realized I didn't want to throw anymore with my right hand. I wanted to tension with my left. And so I taught myself through some videos online. I don't remember what it's called, like knittinghelp.com or something. Knittinghelp.com. So it was, good. What it was a great before, website that was. It was before YouTube. It was before Ralph. She was awesome. I love that website. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then I was obsessed because I realized this is so much faster and I could start to apply all the things that I had learned growing up, making my own clothes that, oh, wait, I can do this with knitting. And it was pretty exciting. Oh, that is, that is very exciting. Um, do you find now, are you happy that you taught yourself to knit continental? Do you feel that it gives you a little bit more control and speed in your knitting? I'm sorry. Did I just I, freeze up? Yeah, I've, froze up for a minute there I keep my internet going <laughs> in and out say it again oh I said um I was wondering if like teaching yourself to knit continental if that felt like it freed you up like do you did it give you some like speed and flexibility that you felt like you were missing it did because I didn't realize at the time that I am left side dominant <laughs> even though I'm right handed oh. And so then it allowed me to have a lot of flexibility to do ribbing more easily to, and it kind of opened the door to combination knitting. 
uh, which is the way that I knit now, a kind of a combination of Eastern and Western. And it, it definitely, I'm a fast person. So it allowed me to complete <laughs> projects faster, which really was thrilling for me. Yeah, I bet. I'm just starting to explore. Um, I've always thrown and um, I'm just starting to explore continental and combination knitting. And so I find, and to the point where I find myself with my yarn in my left hand often without noticing now. Wow, so, that's and so I, cool. Yeah, it's just been, it's been really fun exploring that. And um, that's why I love knitting, right? There's always something new and, you know, something to, yeah, to help advance you in your craft or just bring you more joy. So, um, so you were both knitting. And then you, I was, you know, I did some snooping because I wanted to know <laughs> how you would come to make this amazing book. Um, and I read, and you can tell me if I'm correct or not, that you had both, you had both taken a course on tech editing. Tech editing. Is that what happened? Mm -hmm. And um, we met, oh no, sorry, go ahead. Did you have more? No, no. Oh, well, we were in a, a business community online and we um, had, so we'd seen each other in there. And one day we were just working on the same things and we, um, became accountability partners, like way back. We had only had our businesses. It was like 2018. Yeah. Like, I mean, not even that long. And we just started, you know, we started, we became friends and we talked a lot about work and a lot about the kinds of things we were seeing and, and experiencing with our clients and with our work. And we, 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 it was, it was, it was really special. It was really good. I, we both took the same tech editing course, which is how we met. And the way we both got there is we both were so obsessed with knitting. We wanted to work from home with In our craft. And mm -hmm. we found out that, Hey, you can edit knitting patterns. And it like opened all like the angels saying the heavens open. Woo! <laughs> It was we so were pretty really like, couldn't believe that it was like it was made for us. We've said that before, both of us, and you know, separately, uh -huh. just like it felt like that. Like, you gotta be kidding me. I can take all the things I'm good at and do it in knitting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fine, and, yeah. And so being part of this little tiny tech editor community uh allowed us to not only connect together as business colleagues, but with other tech editors, technical editors. And um we started to just get a lot of questions. There were questions that came up in our group. There was questions that came up in just conversations with other people online. This was all online. Mm -hmm. And this is, we've, we didn't meet in person until a couple of years ago. Um, wow. And so we, uh, we decided to start answering people's questions. In well, but remember, uh, not to interrupt you, Sarah. Oh but yeah, go ahead, that, back up. I'm going too fast. <laughs> well, yeah, because for both of us, we really built our businesses by answering questions. Exactly. You know, even before, um, even before we had any designs on on doing something like a video, what like we ended up doing in 2020, just all the things we put out there and the way that we demonstrated our skills was by answering people's questions. Um, so when when um, we found us like we're all at home and, you know, we were like, why don't we answer these questions? Why don't we just go live on Instagram? We'll just answer people's questions. We'll just, you know. Yeah. It was the height of the pandemic. Like we were all in lockdown and we decided, Hey, let's just go on once a week and people would come on. It was a special time in history where people were just always online. Right. And we would have people show up and just ask question after question. And we'd spend an hour just answering. Yeah. And then we were like, well, maybe we should, maybe we need to focus. If we're going to have people answering questions and we're answering the same things, let's, let's uh, organize a little bit. So we decided to make the tech tip talks, the first ones that we did. And we did like, they all, we had a topic for every video that we did. Mm -hmm. And um, we did that. And then we felt like, okay, we did all the topics, shared all the information that everybody needs. <laughs> No, do we do? Okay. And then, but, but, but this whole time we're getting more questions. We're, we're, con we're getting questions, getting questions. So we started doing live Q and A's again and answering, answering questions. And, and so, interviewing people that we, knew. and then we started interviewing right. guests, tech editors, designers, um, people in the industry. Um, yep. 
to kind of broaden the scope of the answers. Yeah. Like asking because them it questions. was like, so yeah. we've been answering questions yeah. and we've been sharing what we know. How would another tech editor approach this? What is a, what is a designer's experience of, of this? And how would they answer this question? What uh, advice would they offer? How would it be for them? You know, get a different perspective than just the two of us. And then we realized two things. First of all, a lot of this information, people are like, how do you know this? And we're like, <laughs> well, we know it because we're working. You know, we had already right. edited hundreds of patterns. We're working daily in this sphere. And we're like, how do people not know this? And we realized there were a lot of gatekeepers in the industry yeah. and a lot of information that we had access to, or we had learned ourselves through our work, people didn't have access to. Um, it wasn't easy to find. There wasn't one website where you could send people. Right. And we, we were like, it would be great if we didn't have to keep answering the same questions over and over again, that we could hand people a reference and then I don't know how we got to that, but Hey, Christina, let's write a book. Um, um, you know, um, I think also what's in, Sarah and I care a lot about what we do. We care a lot about, uh, as tech editors, we cared a lot about the patterns being good for knitters. That was really important. And I think that that's something maybe we don't talk about a lot, but that's like the undercurrent of this whole project. Um, end of the industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is, is yeah. patterns being good for knitters. So when we were getting patterns coming across our desk and tech editing things and finding the mistakes, and that's how we ended up with the information we learned that we were able to suss out and find out the truth that we were able to share was through, like Sarah said, trial and error, working on these patterns and finding what wasn't working for designers and what was going wrong and how to solve these these problems because we wanted the patterns to be good for knitters. And that's what we are so passionate about. Yes. We, we feel like there's something really important in our industry that yes, patterns is what makes things run. And one of our guests, uh, so it, it recently said this is like, you don't have good patterns. What are people going to make with the yarn? You know, you have a dyer who dyes something and it's like beautiful yarn. The first thing we want to do is what am I going to make? The patterns yeah. are crucial. They're like the, the turning, the, the point where the makers experience the fiber and make something beautiful. And if they don't trust the pattern, if they have a bad experience with a pattern. Wow. That's we've it, all made bad patterns. It's, yeah. it's no good. Yeah. You know? So it's painful. I need the mark. <laughs> <laughs> We're all scarred from that one experience, you know, especially as beginners, when you don't know what you don't know, and you pick up a pattern and you have this blind faith that this person who put this pattern out there must, must they must know, right? And, um, and it just isn't always so, um, which I think is another gift that the two of you are giving to the knitting community is you're helping designers, you're helping us designers elevate our craft. And I truly feel like you've built a bridge for those of us who, um, well, for anybody who's designing, but I didn't grow up in the fiber community. I, you know, I came to knitting later in life. Um, I didn't have anyone around me that I could ask questions of and, so I still have a lot of questions left when I started designing really the best I could do was look at the patterns of people that I admired and see what they had done, but you didn't know how they had gotten from point A to point B. You just, it's very hard to see what is happening behind the scenes. And that's why I feel like this book is that bridge from point A to point B from this vision in your head to creating something that knitters can actually use, can happily use. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I know this book is geared toward designers, but I think that it's valuable for all of us knitters because understanding what is in a good pattern and what to look for um, and why it's there like understanding the why. Um, last year, I started watching a lot of Patty Lyons and read mm -hmm. her book, Knitting Tips and Tricks, which I love. And I love that she focuses on the why. And I feel like this book digs 
into that as well. And um, it just, I think it's going to help knitters grow and it's going to help designers support them as well. Sorry, that's my little, um, <laughs> my little burst of excitement about, it, you know, how important I think this is. It's exciting to see your enthusiasm for it because that was our goal. Our mm -hmm. goal was to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit about what we do in our work as tech editors, because it's not a mystery. We go in there and we make things, <laughs> make sure things are correct and clear and concise mm -hmm. and not difficult, not confusing. <laughs> and the beauty about this is that really you can be a great designer and have a beautiful idea but how do you translate that into a, a difficult technical language so that your makers, yeah. when they read the page, can actually create the same thing that you have in your head? It's not easy. And we wanted to make that easier for people yeah. by giving them an insight into our work and what we look for in, as technical editors to just kind of give people a leg up, give them some tools. Well, I think what yeah. you said before, Becky, about you don't know what you don't know is mm -hmm. that you, a designer might not know why a pattern isn't working for a knitter or what they're getting wrong or what they need to include and wouldn't even yeah. know it needed to be there. Wouldn't know they needed to consider it. Um, like just the chapter on gauge. Um, I think, I think there may be bits of that that will be surprise, surprising or like aha to people. I think that in the ways that it can help knitters is maybe help them evaluate the patterns that they want to make to see if it's going to serve their, what they want, if it's going to be what they want. Um, and I hope it can help them evaluate, evaluate patterns that they want to make. Um, and, and the, you know, the, the charts chapter, uh, like if you're not someone who's that's not your thing, but you want to offer charts mm -hmm. to your knitters. So you want to, you know, figure out how to make them work well in your pattern. You know, hopefully we've guided you to do that. And just the things to watch out for, just the things to check, you know? Um, yeah. So hopefully it, hopefully it will do that. One of the things that our audience has said has been most useful is the checklists. Every <laughs> I was chapter. just going to talk about that. Yes. Please, Every single <laughs> chapter has two things. So we talk about a topic. So we're going to talk about gauge or charts or um, sweater problems, like sweater fit problems. But then at the end, you've got a checklist of the main topics that we went through so that you can say, oh, if I'm measuring gauge, okay, this is what I got to remember. And then we also talk, answer questions specific to that topic that we've received from our audience. Yeah, those are questions we got. Verbatim. Those are questions we got. We went through, we had them and we, we these are questions we got. And, and we don't want people to have to go all over our YouTube channel to find all the questions, right? <laughs> we decided, yes. hey, it really is Thank useful you. to have this in a <laughs> written form that people can reference. We And we chose this size of the book on purpose. on purpose because it fits right in your knitting bag and, and you cannot does. like it is it is nigh indestructible folks i mean this thing is it is it's beautifully a solid bound. little hunk of goodness and it is um and it's the perfect size i love that and it's on nice paper as well the paper's really important. Nice paper. You know, we're, we're like you, <laughs> Becky, we're, we're book people. And we, <sighs> we went to bat for our book that it would not be spiral bound. Mm. We were just so excited when we found out it was going to be hard bound. And we yes. really wanted paper that you could write on. We're, I, I'm a person who does marginalia. So like, I love getting like notes in the columns next and it, yeah. we've, people have told us this is very nice that there is a, a wider place to write things. And yeah. Yes. It, it is kind of a working book, right? And right. if you're going to be working in it, you need to be able to make notes and write. And that's one of the first things we talked to the publisher about was like, look, we have some, this, it's important <laughs> to us what the actual book is going to be. And, and it's part of what we're, what we want to do is how the, the pages will be, how the book will be like, but this is one of the early things we yeah. talked about. The, the it matters. Thing, it does matter. And yeah. the other thing is, is this is not, uh, we have had people who've read it cover to cover, like sat down, just read it over the weekend. Mm -hmm. 
but it doesn't have to be used that way. Our goal was that it would be a useful reference for where you're at. So let's say you want to talk, you want information on accessibility, like how do I make a pattern accessible? You can go into the index and look it up and then go to just that part and look at the, how we answered that question or what we suggestions we've made. Or maybe you're at the point where you're like, oh, hey, I want to create a pattern that people can buy and make. What do I do next? Oh, oh, I need a tech editor. How do I hire a tech editor? Oh, we've got a whole chapter on it. And there are references, resources, appendices at the end. So even if you don't use, even if you don't, don't look things up, you can go, oh, I'm, I got to go look up how to make my style sheet. I got to go check this sizing standard. What book should I use for X, Y, Z? It's all in there. Yeah, when so. they say appendices, I mean, this is some serious data that they're sharing with you. I mean, there are numbers upon numbers and visuals and also, you know, references to where you can find further information. I mean, I feel like if we had had this when we started um, creating nomadic knits, um, I mean, it would have been, it would have been life-changing and that's not hy hyperbole, hyperbole. It's, I mean, it would have, because all of these things about that you don't think about when you look at it, a well-done pattern, because you don't have to think about it. Yeah. Um, just the section on style sheets alone. And um, if you're not familiar, uh, style sheet is basically when you're choosing the formatting for your patterns that you want to be consistent across all of your patterns. This was as a magazine, this was pretty high up on our list of to do's. Um, and because we were um, receiving patterns from different designers, you know, multiple different designers, every issue, they would come in in all different types of formats, not having been tech edited, and we would have to fit them to our own specific style. And this book lays it all out for you. So say you're an aspiring designer or publisher and you want to have consistency across your patterns. There's a checklist in this book that walks you through things that you need to choose, colors and fonts and sizes and abbreviations and you know how you will um, display repeats. That was one of the things that I found interesting, you know, asterisks versus parentheses. And um, so it really is just, a step-by-step -step guide and literal checklist throughout the whole process. I mean, I love how the just, checklists have, have how they can move you through the book. I will never forget yeah. the day Sarah says to me, Christina, I think every chapter needs a checklist because we had <laughs> our main, we had our main checklist, right? right. The pre-edit checklist that was in the book mm -hmm. and that we have, she was like, I think every chapter needs it. And I was like, all right, let's yeah. do it. Let's, Let's write them up. And then, you know, and it's a different way um, of going through the, through the chapter and a different way of looking at, at the chapter and helping you zero in on what to, what you what you need to focus on at the and end of the day. I just want to talk a little bit about the fact that this book is, you know, I've had my, my family's read part of it and they're like, I can hear your voice in it, but we worked really hard to not have this be my book not have this be Christina's book, but yeah. a, a real collaborative work. Our goal as who we are in our business is not to um, elevate community over competition. Our goal as business owners is to lift other people up. And we, we really wanted this book to be something that kind of pushes back on us is the way it's always done or push in, on the way, I uh, push on this whole thought that I've got to, you know, elbow my way up. We, we want to be helpful and we want to make sure everybody has the same access and tools and ability to go farther. We, we want to elevate knitting patterns in the industry. Yes. But we also see this as a bigger job of creating size inclusive patterns, um, creating patterns that help other people that isn't just you know anyways i think there's I mean, inclusivity is creating inclusivity is also creating access mm -hmm. um and yeah. you know you, you do that by sharing what sharing what you know and if you you know 
our videos that we made that we built this book off of um it's both of us that that make that work and that contribute to the information and how it's shared and and what the it, what's being relayed and we are really excited that we were able to keep that like that our voice our yeah. voice is united in there and like Beautiful. you can hear us um it was hard work because uh, kudos to our editors, man, that they were able to <laughs> maintain our our ideas and our way of talking, but also it is, it's not distinctive like, oh, you can only hear Sarah, you can only hear Christina. We mm -hmm. really wanted it to be something that was joined. Well, and some things that they would want to change, we'd be like, yeah, but this is really what, how okay. we said it, mm -hmm. you know? You know, this is what we want to say. And, you know, some things like Sarah was saying about things always being done a certain way means they have to be done that way. You know, mm. I, it's really important in life, but um, also in um, designing inclusive patterns, meaning it's for everybody that you don't get mired down in, well, this is the way it's always been done. Well, exactly. this way doesn't yeah. work for, for everyone. Yeah. And this way isn't going to work in this instance. So while those that's good, you know, for what, it, what it's good for, it's not going to, it's not going to be good for this. So we're not going to just throw this out that we think is important because of how something's always been done. Um, yeah, yeah we're not. And here that. I think our goal with this book was to give hope too. Yeah. you, you know, you, you talk Becky, like of some of the people who may be watching this are just knitters and not designers, but I would say if they read this book, they might go, Hey, I can write a knitting pattern. I, yeah. I could, after you read this book, you could say, well, now I've got all the, all the tools that I need. I think it provides a lot of information and hope that, Hmm, this is, this is not the mystery that I thought it was. Well, and you talk about, um, accessibility and inclusivity and, you know, I had mentioned the book felt like a bridge to me and, you know, you'd also mentioned the gatekeeping of all this information before, and it did feel as if there was no way to find it. And now there is, there is this very tangible way to find this information. Um, and I think it's going to open the doors to so many more people um, to do those things, um, whether they want to design or not. But I do think that, you know, there are a lot of people who they're like, oh, I don't, you know, I didn't use a pattern. I just knit this. Um, but they don't say that they designed it because they didn't write it down. And now they have the tools mm -hmm. to do so. And um, they have, they can learn the skills to communicate with a tech editor to take it one step further, you know, to sort of up level that design. And um, I do feel that you've, pro you've provided this accessibility um, to information that just really wasn't available anywhere before in one one volume one mm -hmm. volume I mean one tiny little throw it in your knitting it's bag in your project volume. bag <laughs> yeah I mean there are a lot of design books for all different kinds of things you right. want, want to make all so many design design books and yeah. things like that to help you figure that out but how like Sarah said earlier you're getting that on the written page that people can follow and reproduce successfully um, yeah. and I think that like, there's a, you, like you were saying about the style sheets. I mean, there's a kind of a theme running through all of the chapters about consistency and communication and evenness. And that's for everything. That's for your grading. That's for how you communicate everything in the pattern. That's for how you communicate with the collaborators, people you're working with, dyers, deck editors, knitters. That's for how you've styled it. That's for how you write the instructions. There's everything needs to be done consistently for it to work. And everything needs to be communicated yeah. clearly for it to work. So that's kind of like what it's all about. Wasn't that part of your, um, your four C's? The book opens with your four <laughs> C's, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, what are, what are they? Consistency? Oh <laughs> Go. I have Come it. On. I have it right here. I've got Clarity, it. consistency, <laughs> conciseness, correctness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And for any pattern to be that... successful. It must we, be correct, clear, concise, and consistent, which is, and we, we grab yeah. that from, you know, basic copy editing, 
I mean, this is, yeah. this is what, that's not our idea. It's what this it is. is. This is what happens if you edit yeah. any kind of publication, you, these, these yeah. characteristics have to be there and it absolutely applies to something this technical. Yeah. Well, cause don't forget, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's not, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's clo it's a pattern for clothing. That has to be specific and done well to fit a body. And that is its purpose. That is its goal. That's what it has to do. So mm -hmm. yes, this, this uh, instruction to get you there has to be, it has to be all those things, or you're not going to be able to, uh, to get your goal, your end result of what it's supposed to give you. So, and I think yeah. the other, the other thing about this, and I, I know we've, we've talked about how everyone has a bad experience with patterns what that actually does to relationships is key. If, if, you know, if you're a hand dyer and you produce, you, you know, you work with a, a pattern writer to produce a pattern for a particular colorway that's special. And then when people go to work the pattern, it doesn't work. The numbers, you know, say the cast on numbers are wrong or whatever it is, whatever error there is, it's confusing. You're missing a chart. you you don't have a schematic. Um, what that actually reflects on your business that actually reflects on people don't trust you. They, they will be unhappy. And I think there could be a lot said for communication is key, but also good communication and correct communication and clear communication and concise communication allows this trust relationship with your customers that can make people super fans. And I, I know in my community, in my knitting community here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, if, if the knitters love a pattern, they will buy every pattern. They don't care who, they may never make it. They have, you know, hundreds of patterns in their queue. They, they'll just buy them if they trust the designer, if they trust mm -hmm. the yarn company that's producing the patterns. I mean, consider a knitter who's having a hard time finding a pattern in their size that finds one and so excited. Oh my God, this is going to fit me. Look at this, the measurements, da, 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 this is my size. And they buy the yarn and they get gauge and they all this money and time buy the pattern. And it doesn't, it doesn't work. Like you said, it's confusing. It doesn't come out to the size they thought. The schematic meant something else or the finished measurements and the size was confused or, you know, and they didn't get what was shown that was what they were told they yeah. were going to get. They're not going to buy your pattern again. They're going to be upset. No. And you're going to, as a designer, you're going to have uh, um, a lot of um, questions and support issues from knitters contacting you and being like, wow, what did I do wrong? And knitters often, most of the time are going to think they did something wrong, that it's exactly. their fault. And, you yeah. know, once in a while that might be so, you know, of course, I mean, some knitter knitters error. also have responsibility for their own projects, mm -hmm. but a lot of, you know, a lot of patterns lead knitters astray and they're not going to buy your patterns again. And we want designers to succeed. Yeah, hundred percent. And so yeah. as tech editors, we're the number one cheerleader of designer. We're like, we want yes. your pattern to be awesome yes. because we want your business yes. to succeed. And it's hard to make it as a designer these days. It's hard to make it as a hand dye company. It's hard to make it as a yarn company. And the way that you do that is by curating these fantastic relationships with your customers and yeah. hello, we're all making patterns and we want to love what we make and we want success. Clear and correct on pattern. our needles. We want to get the finished item that is promised us. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. And I think, um, you know, you had mentioned dyers and you know their collaborations with designers as well. And I think that this information is um, pertinent to pretty much anybody in the industry because as you guys had said, everybody's interacting with patterns. It's, you know, the architecture, it's like the framework of, of what knitters are doing. They're, they're creating things from patterns. And um, whether you're a yarn shop owner and you're, you know, you're featuring patterns to sell the yarn that's in stock, it's important that you have an understanding of a good pattern and also that 
you know, that you're establishing trust with these designers and dyers, you know, just it, all that communication and trust, it all goes around and around. And if you can um, do it well, it just makes for such a beautiful experience for everyone. Um, and having, you know, well done patterns is, you know, at the heart of that. It's one of the things that makes it all work. And while they're, you know, the way that patterns are published may change, um, you know, we talked about how printing is more expensive now. Uh, yes. You might see some magazines now are not being produced anymore. Um, the, f the fact of the matter is, is we all still are going to have patterns. Patterns are yep. going to be made somehow and produced, even if just digitally. Uh, so I don't think pattern making is going to go away. Um, what I think may morph is what we include in the pattern. And we, we talk a lot about that, how that's, that really is up to the designer, how much they want to help, how much they want to include, and they get to work with their testers and their tech editor to uh, make it the best they can. How to go about being honest about what, um, what your pattern offers and who your pattern is for, you know, um, because it, your, the patterns have to deliver on the promise they make to them. I, there's an entire chapter on, I think you had mentioned it before on hiring a, a tech editor Working and how to editor. have a success, uh, how to have a successful relationship with your tech editor. Um, and I, I briefly went through it, but I'm really excited to, you know, read it fully because we have worked with um, some wonderful tech editors in the past, but I, know that I am more to learn for sure about this. And I was wondering if either of you had any, um, like what, if you could tell me what makes, like who is a tech editor's dream client? <laughs> what is it? What is it about a designer? How can we designers be the best clients possible? Um, to foster a good relationship with a tech editor. Wow. Don't ghost your tech editor. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Right back. You know, um, I think, uh, even if you don't use checklists, have some kind of way that you're organizing things. Um, even if your tech editor guides the organizational process, but, um, correct the mistakes, um, tell them what, what you've done differently. I'm, you know, I, I don't mean to keep saying this, but communicating is so important. hundred um, percent. Any kind of pattern can be made better and any kind of relationship can be, be good. If you're communicating what needs to be. So the tech has got to communicate what needs to be fixed. The designers got to communicate when they can do it, that they've done it, how they've done it. Um, that's gotta be good. If that's got to be good. And you've got to be able to, I think you have to feel safe. I know this seems silly to talk about in a business situation, but Absolutely. you have to feel safe. The you as a tech editor, like you want your designer to feel safe talking with you. Um, this project, uh, you, you have to be able to feel safe with your tech editor. And if you don't, don't, don't ghost them. Don't stay in it and, you know, feel like you're stuck. It's okay to move on if it doesn't work out, you know, mm -hmm. but communicate, I would say, got to communicate. I love I, how you, in the book, it mentions um, how vulnerable you can mm -hmm. feel as a designer when you're sending something off. Basically, you're sending it off and asking somebody to find every mistake I've made <laughs> and then tell me about it. When Super in reality, hard. Like, like that is not generally what most people want to hear. Like, hi could you please take a good look at me and point out every single flaw right. and then I will do my best to fix it. It being um, edited is hard. Yeah, it's it hard. Is very difficult, but I love that you address it and just point it out because I think that so many of us just assumed that people were just wonderful enough that it was like a few little errors, you know, here and there and just everybody else is fine. And we're the only ones screwing it all up, you know, cause every once in a while you just have a clunker or you make a big, like mm -hmm. error somewhere. It happens, especially when you're like churning out more and more 
designs. And I think just knowing that that is an everybody thing. That's an everybody thing. We all feel vulnerable when we're sending our creations out into the world. And I think part of being uh, confident in who you are as a designer is acknowledging, I do make mistakes. Okay, what Mm -hmm. can I learn from this? Um, Seeing mistakes not as a stain on your character or even your ability to design and create, but mistakes in a pattern are just it's just part of the process. Okay. What, how can I make this better? How can we work together as a team to, uh, turn this pattern into something great? Um, I think for a designer to have the mindset that my tech editor is on my team and is we're collaborating together. I do not have to do this by myself. They've got my back. They want the best for me. Um, and to have that viewpoint, means that you are on the right path to having a successful pattern. Um, if you are, if there's some animosity there that, that, that can make things really difficult. Um, tech editors love to find mistakes. It's a treasure hunt for us, but (laughs) you cannot take what they point out to you personally, but rather say, Oh, great. Let's fix it. Okay. Oh, great. We found another one. Fantastic. That's one I do, will not have to deal with in customer service with yes. my makers. Seriously. <laughs> oh yeah. That's the, I mean, it is, it is just no good when something slips by, you know, that's, that's the worst feeling. I think, I think after having experienced, you know, something slip by and get into, you know, a knitter's hands, that has made, that has changed my perspective on, you know, having a lot of feedback from a tech editor because that is way less painful than having something out in the world that is just incorrect and having to have a knitter say, hey, this isn't right. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, no. And there is an, <laughs> uh, there is an ongoing debate on whether or not people even need a tech editor. And maybe some in your audience would be like, who needs a technical editor? I can edit my own patterns if I work them myself. Or if I have, you know, a friend knit the pattern. We're a little frozen. Oh, she froze a little. We'll wait for her to come back here. (laughs) Yeah. I sorry, I lost lost me again. There we go. But you're back. You're back. (laughs) We tech editors are trained to see things and to do things. Um, in a way that uh, just an average knitter won't be able to do. Yes, that is the truth. I mean, we've done, so we, for Nomadic Knits, we tech edit all the patterns and then we test knit them. And there's editing that happens all the way through. And even after the tech editing and the testing, you know, once we put them into layout, then there is sometimes even more style mm. editing that happens. There's just so many things. Um, and Melissa and I did all of that back and forth together. And you would think that you would catch it all the first time, right? And that's just never how it happens. Um, and it's never just one person that sees it all or gets everything. Well, and remember that every time you go into that document, it might not even be that you're finding something old. Every time you go into that document, you're possibly introducing error. And anytime you make a change, it needs to be checked. Yes, exactly. Anytime you go into that document, there's potential for new things to be found because if you make a change, if you've introduced error in any way, it's got to be checked again. I remember getting, um, you know, sometimes get edits and I, I was the one and I do the formatting for the magazine. So I do all the layout and everything. And I'd get an edit where I had to insert like 12 characters. And I would just about bring me to my knees, you know, as for like a week from deadline, because I'm like 12 characters. Oh my God. <laughs> now we have to go through and check the next four pages again in every exactly. single margin and paragraph. And, you know, because that's true. It's so easy to introduce an error when you're fixing an error. 
um, it can throw off your your style, your formatting, um, your line breaks just all of a sudden become nonsensical because yeah. there's you know just it's happening right one line before the end of a section of the pattern there's a total page break and you're like well this doesn't make any sense anymore yeah. so then you have to yeah those things you need you need extra eyes for and um and also as a if you're trying to test knit your own pattern the other thing is that you're reading your own language of mm -hmm. course you know how to do it number one it was in yeah. your head that way and then you know, you're reading the same language that you speak, but not everybody else is. And so how well, also we, we skim over stuff. We don't think we're skimming over stuff. We don't yeah. mean to be skimming over stuff, but we are, we're flying yeah. right over it. We know what we're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, tech editing and same as like proofreading, you've got to, you go slow. You are yeah. reading every character and checking style mistakes, for example, or formatting mistakes or punctuation right. you're looking at every single thing and in a line of instruction which of course knitting is patterns and millions of lines of instruction <laughs> um every article uh has a potential to screw it up right like if the comma's out of place it means a whole new thing so, <laughs> exactly it's a completely different pattern like yeah yeah it's um so i totally understand that um that concept of you know yes tech editing matters for everyone. It, it really does. There's no, um, and I get that that can feel like a roadblock to some people because, you know, tech editors need to be compensated just like designers need to be con compensated and dyers need to be compensated. So it is an expense. And I do think, but I do think that like having this book as a resource gives you an added layer of detail as a designer, you know, to check yourself and to make the most out of your time with a tech editor. Um, well, because, and to do is to, to, you know, the better the pattern is before you get it to them, you know, yes. cause I mean, we get it. Like that's a real concern. Yes, yes. Tech editing is important and we think it's really valuable and everyone should work with a tech editor on their patterns if they're writing patterns, but it's a real concern, the cost, because the more yeah. we include in patterns and the more we want to offer, it adds to what needs to be checked. Um, yep. and it's not always, an, it's not a, it's not enough to knit it through, especially something in multiple sizes, a tech editor is looking at all the sizes and how the whole pattern works together yeah. and everything relates to each other in the pattern. So um, it's a real concern, the cost. I get that. Um, uh, but yeah. it's, uh, it's a valuable, it's valuable. So Very if you valuable. get our book, if you get yeah. our book, we have all the checklists for you to make the pattern as good as possible, as correct and clear as possible before it goes to the editor, the fewer mistakes there are in the pattern, the cheaper the tech edit, and that can reduce the cost for designing. Yeah. And it can also, um, protect your designer's heart. <laughs> <laughs> as you send it out into the world <laughs> because it will, you know, you'll feel good about what you've done because you, you know, have a little bit more knowledge in your pocket. You're going to feel good about it. You're going to send it out and you are going to feel more like you are collaborating with your teammate, your tech editor, um, because you're speaking the same language. Um, and I, I just feel like it's such a, a more fulfilling experience when everybody is kind of on the same page and speaking that same language and and having an understanding of um what the other has on their plate i mean i think that always helps in collaborations when you um understand what your collaborator is taking care of to get to the point where you're working together it just you know, makes us all a little bit more understanding of time and energy and those things that it takes to, to get to something beautiful. So I think that this, you know, will really can help everybody speak the same language. Um, I wanted to check and make sure that I'm not um, missing anything here because I wanted to, um, I had some questions written down for you ladies. Um, oh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because I had read um, 
or heard you speak about, you know, or, well, we even talked about it so far today. We were talking about how you were getting the same questions over and over. Um, so this isn't so much about the questions, but what is, um, what would you say the top three errors are that come to you as tech editors? Like what are the most common that you just like, you know, that's like the low hanging fruit. You're gonna swoop in and you're gonna fix these things first. And then you're gonna help your designers not make those mistakes anymore. I, I think we, Christina might have a different three, but I'll give my three. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, let's have it. <laughs> let's see if my internet connection will be stable enough for three. Um, <laughs> gauge is not what it like the a designer will make a gauge swatch and then write a pattern off of it and then make the sample and the final sample is actually has a different gauge and then so the instructions and the pattern the gauge doesn't actually match the pattern um, as this happened a lot and it happens pretty frequently if if there's issues with numbers and it doesn't match the measurements it's like, it's usually related to a gauge issue. Like the gauge has been mismeasured. And that's why we did a whole chapter on gauge. The second thing, well, I, I don't know if this is really an error. It's more of a style issue, but there's a lot, there can be inconsistencies in the way that abbreviations or punctuation is used. And that makes it like makes a hiccup in the, the maker like, oh, well, why is this different? Um, when you make things different yeah. and you don't use the same terminology or the same way of talking about things, then it can, it's actually a style error, but it's can lead to technical errors. And then I think the three thing, the third thing is uh, the finished measurements of the actual thing doesn't really match what you're making, like the, the stitch counts and all of that. And that can lead back to gauge, but it can be other technical errors too. Ding, ding, ding. You got <laughs> yeah, it. Ding, ding. That's what it is. All That's right. what it is. And you know, those are big those things. Those are easy like, to fix. They're, they're, they're big things because the one in the middle, having little style errors like that, they will cause confusion and confusion will cause mistakes. And then you're right. And the measurements, the gauge, the, all that, that's, that's the, bread and butter here. That's, that's gotta be right. And there can be lots of different reasons that happens. Um, and there's lots of different ways designers need to choose how to solve those problems. Um, but yeah, very often. And I, th I think part of the thing too, is designers get to decide how to solve it. This is the designer's work. And I think that's something designers need to recognize is that the editor, that generally speaking, editors are not going to fix your work. Um, they, it, you have the agency as a designer to decide how to solve the problems. A lot of times we'll mark things on a pattern and say, we'll give a suggestion on how to fix it, but then the designer will come back with something way more clever because they're in the work. It's their mm -hmm. process, their creative process. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing how designers just brilliantly solve some of the issues together. I mean, this is something that I think is important because um, there is a little bit of maybe it's something that's different um, working as an independent designer with directly with a tech editor and not through um, a publisher or a bigger company or something. Mm -hmm. um, but like Sarah just said, the designer is the best one to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. They know the fix. You might see an error or see something that's wrong, but where that error start? Where's that fix really got to be? It, it might, might be not farther back. It might not need to be where you think it needs to be. Mm -hmm. The fix might be somewhere else. Um, and like the gauge issue, is the gauge wrong or did the sample come out wrong? Like what, you know, where's the fix got to be? And it's not always going to be something the tech editor can fix. Sometimes it is, um, but it's not always. And so I think designers do need to recognize that, that yes, uh, tech editors are going to point out all your corrections, um, but even working with a publisher, myself anyway, um, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to be fixing things, but I'm going to be asking the designer questions too, um, because they're the ones that are the best qualified to fix the problem because they're pattern. And I can tell you this anecdotally, this is the hardest part about writing this book because we're used to being on, in the editor's seat, mm. working, you know, 
correcting and making changes and, you know, doing things from an editor standpoint. And it was hard to be edited for this book. Like we had to, it, we, oh, we, now we got to go fix stuff. Oh, now we got, oh, that number's wrong. Oh, the spreadsheet's wrong. And I think we were we get quite it. bristly and defensive. We probably. were bristly and defensive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, what are you Maybe talking just about? between us, like we 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 grumble a little bit with you. We'd be nice to our editor, but oh yeah, yeah we're so we're super nice to them. But we'd be like, we get it. Yeah, no do way. Do they even knit? Do they even knit? Did they That's read the? the yeah. Did they read the manuscript? Yeah. But we gave big giant thanks to our editor, and we even said, I'm sure this process took longer because we are editors, and so. You know, um, we, cause we were, we would be nitpicking too, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I can, I can imagine, I can imagine, <laughs> but it is tough. It is tough as somebody who is normally the one. It is. I mean, portion. they had to, yeah, they had to say to us uh, and it was hard. They were like, please try not. Cause we'd be sending back a copy uh, a review and we'd have like, you know, little typos and, you know, we'd be fixing things. And she had to say on the last time, please try not to look at Perfect. little proofreading issues. It's going to be proofread like four times. Try not to focus on that, but man, it's hard. <laughs> it's so hard. We can't turn it off. I, I will tell you this. If there's anybody who's watching this now, that is just like, what is technical editing? Oh, that sounds like me. Yeah, we there. It is a particular character yeah. and personality. If you can see things, like you notice little things nobody else notices, and it like gets you excited to find things. Oh, mm, yeah. You, you might be a technical editor. It's yeah. it's hard to it turn that part thing. of our brain off. <laughs> it could be your calling. So if it anybody could be. out there is watching, and this is. And all of this sounds really exciting. And you already have thought of five different patterns that you've seen in the last month that you would really like to get your hands on and just, you know, zhuzh it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And tech editing, editing might be your, your calling. It may be. <laughs> and we need great tech editors in the industry. There's always a need for great people who have a, a professional and uh, enthusiastic view of making patterns great. And I know that you both offer some resources. Obviously, the book is an amazing resource. If anybody is interested in, well, I said it before, if you do anything around knitting, you should just get the book. But if you're interested in tech editing, you absolutely should have this book. Um, but also, if you're interested in tech editing, you have, can you tell us where we can find you and what other services and kind of information that each of you offer? I currently run the Tech Editor Hub, which is an online place for people to learn how to be a technical editor and to connect with tech editors. So if you're looking for a tech editor for your pattern, I do provide um, a resource for that, like where you can go put in, hey, I need a tech editor for this pattern. And I have a private list of more than 80 editors that can help you out. Um, but if you want to be a technical editor, then you can come on over to my website, thetecheditorhub.com and find out more about what it takes to become one. Um, it's, it's a fun business. That's what I'm doing now. And I also provide coaching for designers who want to learn how to grade, but don't want to take a class. They want someone to walk them through each step in one of their designs. Um, and I do that one-on-one. -on -one through that's sarahwalworth.com. Mm -hmm. That's a great program. I mean, that is um, that is a tough, grading is tough. It is. I'm sure it doesn't, I'm sure that you make it less tough, but it really feels oh. like a daunting task when you are tackling yeah. that as a designer, especially for the first time. Um, and anytime really that the style of the garment that you're, designing has changed, you know, the grading shifts. It's not a like set it and forget it kind of thing. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, so you guys are also, tell me, tell me the other places where we can find you as well. Go ahead, Christina. Well, I have a, a, a weekly newsletter that I send out through Substack um, and also a special once awesome. a month post. And um, it's uh, uh 
it's about this too. Um, resources for size inclusive, fat positive, um, pattern writing and excellent pattern writing. And for designers, but also for knitters, um, I think we'll, you know, um, and that's, you can get that, find that on my website. I consult, do consulting with designers and tech editors on their business or patterns, things that are tripping them up that they need guidance on. Um, uh, Sarah and I have a Patreon for Tech Tip Talk, where we've Yay. built a, we have a little community of designers and tech editors and just really special people um, where we talk about all kinds of things of all kinds of things going on in there. And it's a really valuable resource, I think, because it's not, um, it's not necessarily expensive. You have access to us. You can ask all kinds of questions, but you also have access to all these wonderful minds and other people who are in the trenches with you that can give you feedback and that you can share, um, your work with in a really supportive, uh, special way. So that's a really cool thing that we're doing. That sounds fantastic. I mean, just having some like-minded folk in a community where you can rely on each other and um, and ask those little quick questions that you wonder where you're supposed to take. Yeah, you know, sometimes we have these questions. You know, like where do I where do I send do it? I ask <laughs> who's going to help me. So that sounds like a wonderful resource. Well, and we're pretty all... chill. We're pretty chill too. So it's like <laughs> yeah. a chill, safe situation. You know, it's not not anything to get get nervous about yeah and uh once a month we are still on youtube at techtiptalk.com um and we interview someone within the industry that we want to just hear what they have to say we usually pick their brain about a particular topic um and our goal with our youtube channel is to encourage designers in their business um, to help them to see that they're not alone and also to get some resources from other colleagues that are creating. We have some pretty enlightening conversations with these designers and tech editors. You can also search by topic on our YouTube channel and um, you can even just browse. Uh, Sarah's done a great job of making thumbnails for our videos that have the main topic of the conversation in the thumbnail. So you can just really quickly um, find things that you're looking for, topics that you want to know more about, uh, people you want to hear from. Um, so I think it's a really user-friendly place to find more information and, and get more insight. Our, our goal fantastic. is for people to have the information that they need for not to be hidden. And so especially, hey, if you go to our YouTube channel and you subscribe, let us know who you want us to interview because we don't know everybody. And uh, <laughs> we've uh, most of the people that we've interviewed have been on the suggestion from our patrons or from other people who said, Hey, you should interview this person. And it's been, it's been fantastic. Or people that inspire us too. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal like is for designers and to have success. Like that's the goal Absolutely. of all of this so that knitters have success. That's perfect. I mean, that's a great goal. And um, this is a really good, you know, stepping off point for so many people. Um, you created community and you created these spaces where people can come and get their answers. And now you have this gorgeous book. And um, I just want to say congratulations. It's no small feat accomplishing something like this. So um Everybody keep your eye out for this. Check out your local yarn shops. You can, um, I'll make sure that there are links to where you can find this as well if you don't have it at your local yarn shop. Um, but you really should get your hands on it. Um, and hopefully we'll be seeing more of you ladies in the future. Who knows? Maybe we'll get to chat again sometime down the line and you can let everybody know what else you're up to because it sounds like, um, you know, the good things just keep coming. You've been building on this uh, steadily, it seems like for a while now with more and more good stuff. Um, we can also find you on Instagram, right? At tech, tech Tip Talks. Yeah, it's app. a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can say it. Oh, it's so funny. People in like our real life, they're like, cat, you know, nobody can do it. <laughs> it is a mouthful, but it's easier to type in. So, um, and I'll also just put the link below here and you can just go visit them and, uh, and keep an eye on what they're doing and, um, and check out their individual 
blogs and websites as well, especially if you have any aspirations of, you know, designing or tech editing. Um, these are the people you want to be talking to, and they have a wonderful sense of community, as you can tell, and are here to um, uplift you and encourage you and help you with the tools that you need to be successful and to contribute in a meaningful way to the knitting community. So I really hope that you will visit them. And thank you both so much for being here. Is there anything else you'd like to share with um, our viewers before we sign off here? Thank you for having us, Becky. It's been a real privilege to chat with you. Thanks, thank Becky. You. It's been great. Oh, thanks for being here.